Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. And Father, my prayer first and foremost is that you make us one as you are one. Father God, that you challenge us and that you teach us and that you grow us, Lord. As we are grafted into your vine, Father God, that your love and your truth would flow through us and that that would be the fruit that we bear. As we kind of think about this time and in our minds we celebrate this time as the time when Jesus was sent to earth. Lord, let's take cognizance and, and conscience of the fact that you had a plan and a purpose and your purpose was for forgiveness and restoration. We pray, Father God, that you would lift the up in our hearts. Open up your word to us by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill us, move us, touch us. Guide us and, and teach us. I ask that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week, we, I started in, in the book of Luke, and we were chatting about the birth of John the Baptist and um, how it's, it's quite interesting if you have a look at there's this wonderful pattern in Scripture where God takes the totally impossible and he makes it completely natural and normal. Isn't that incredible? I'm sure all of us can attest to some point in our lives where we've experienced something where it shouldn't have worked in the natural, but somehow it's just solved itself. And uh, someone once said to me, he said, sometimes God's miracles appear unremarkable, but when you look carefully at them, you realize how profound they are, how miraculous they are. He sort of... The, the, the joke that's made is, you know, when the first time that God spoke, the stars came out of his mouth, right? So he doesn't have to explain himself. He just says what he means and means what he says, and, and then he carries on. And uh, we see the birth of the Hebrew nation through Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah being a woman in her old age and unable to have children, and yet somehow she has a child. And then we see this event with Martha, uh, with uh, Elizabeth, sorry, um, where she is a, as an older woman and hasn't had been able to have children either, and how the angel visits them, visits Zechariah in the Holy of Holies and says, you, you're going to have a son. And how the moment Zechariah is home, that Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And then Mary goes to meet with her, and in that moment, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth exclaims that this child jumps in her womb as he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then that was sort of where we left off. And I want to just continue on with this because it's so interesting to me how this all ties together with the, the concept of the birth of Christ. So Mary, so Mary, must I turn that speaker around? Will it help maybe? No. Oh, it's off. Okay. Sorry, I thought it was bouncing off there. So... Mary stays with Elizabeth for quite some time. Obviously, with her being an older woman, the pregnancy is, is, is difficult or perhaps uncomfortable, I would imagine, very uncomfortable. And, um, and she, she stays with her for, for, for a time. But before this happens, as Elizabeth gives this glad cry when she hears Mary's voice in uh, Luke 42, I haven't given this to you, but I want to just go there for context quickly, Sharon, sorry. Um, she heard the, the greeting and the baby jumped in her womb and Elizabeth's response were, blessed are you because, of what, because the Lord would do what he said. So God is true to his promises. And then Mary's response is this prophetic song. And it sounds a bit strange, but it's really beautiful if you, if you listen to it. If you maybe join me. It's in Luke, uh, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47 and on. So the magnificent song of praise is the, is the label given to it. So Mary responds, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in Christ our Savior. For he took notice of a lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty, and the mighty one is holy. And he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. And the clarity there, the word there, fear, is respect, not, ah, I'm going to get zapped. 
we could get zapped, but it's, it, the concept there is, is not fear, but, but awe and wonder. Verse, 30, verse 51, the mighty arm has done tremendous things. It's quite a poignant saying, and, and there's quite a lot of references to this mighty arm. In Isaiah and Samuel, in Psalms, um, for those who are taking notes, I can give you some, some references. Second Samuel 22, 28, if you're taking notes. Um, Psalm 89, verse 10. Also one of those references. And every time scripture throughout the Old Testament references God's mighty arm, the reference is Christ. It's referring to the Messiah that's coming, to the word that's doing things. So, so Mary is already, although not pregnant yet, although not you know, she's like not sure where this is going exactly. There's this concept that there's something massive coming. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down the princes from their thrones. He has exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel. He remembered and remembered to be merciful. And it seems strange that God remembered to be merciful. Like, we understand God is merciful, right? Like, God is, you know, he's gentle and he's kind. But there are many occasions in the Old Testament where God said, like, that's it. That you've, you've stepped off the mark. You've stepped out of line. And, and this is now where there's a certain amount of authority that needs to be taken. In fact, we see a number of cases in the temple where there was worship and, and the Lord said that they, they were worshipping in an unworthy manner and he struck down the entire orchestra. They were, they were struck dead on the spot. Men were struck dead in the temple. Um, when, they tried to, when one of David's men tried to stop the Ark of the Covenant from falling off the wagon, the Lord struck him down immediately. There was like a standard. So you must understand that Mary's mind is, is an understanding of the Old Testament. There's, there's a loving God, but he's got very, very hard boundaries, and, and we can't step over them. Verse 55, For he made a promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. So then the, she notes that, that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was the last kind of, it can't help, can't happen pregnancy, but was a touchstone moment in history, and that, that Elizabeth's pregnancy is, Again, a biologically can't happen scenario, but is a touchstone moment in pregnancy. And it says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for a few months and then went back to her own home. So she was there to kind of support Elizabeth, encourage her, be a practical support. And what stands out for me always is God is practical, right? He's, he's super, super practical. She was having a supernatural experience happening. But she needed hands to hold on to. She needed support and encouragement. She needed someone to just be there in this challenging time. And it says that John was born. Oh, sound system's fighting with me. And John was born. And, um, and then something really significant happens. When in, in the Judaic culture, when a, child, when a male child is eight days old, they are circumcised. And at their circumcision ceremony, the child's name will be brought forward. So the child will then be named as, as, be given their name as such officially. It was so interesting for me yesterday listening to, to the master of ceremonies who was talking about all their genealogies, how certain people got certain names and therefore they became sort of the head of the next part of the family. And in many ways in the Jewish culture, this was the same thing. Someone got a name and their name was who they were, what they were what defined them, how they, how they lived and breathed and existed, and where they came from. You know, surnames weren't as common as we think. If we have a look, it says, it says so-and-so, son of so-and-so, the, you know, he's from this tribe, and he's this, this guy's son. So fathers to sons got names. I look at my family, my, in, in, in the six generations that I've been, on the seventh generation that we've lived in South Africa, and every single eldest or firstborn son in, in my family's bloodline, this, our second name is our father's name. So there's kind of like a way to, to track it. 
And if you go to the book of Matthew, if you open up the first piece of Matthew, you'll see there's this long genealogy that leads eventually to Joseph and then obviously to Jesus. So this whole concept of a name was very, very important. So you can imagine that there was a little bit of a confusion happening because first of all, Zechariah encounters an angel and I don't doubt for a moment that the whole region got to hear about that, the, that God had spoken because it had been the first time in 400 years that God had spoken. It was a massive event. There was an anticipation of something incredible going to happen. His wife Elizabeth couldn't have children, yet suddenly now she was pregnant. And then the child is born. There isn't a miscarriage. There isn't a loss of the pregnancy. This is actually happening. So now they take him to the temple to be circumcised and to be named. <clears throat> and of course, tradition dictates he should get his father's name. If you have a look here in, verse, in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 57, I'm not sure if I gave you that one as well, shares my apologies. Let's just read from there on. And when it was time for Elizabeth's boy, baby to be born, she gave birth to her son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, Everybody rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. It's a very, very significant ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah because that's his dad's name and that means his bloodline has continued because at this point, Zechariah's lineage is going to stop. Actually considered shameful. Culturally, it was a problem for, for many. Um, Zechariah, after his father. But Elizabeth says, no, his name is John. So now remember, Zechariah is unable to speak. But what's very interesting is, let's keep going and, and see what plays itself out. What they exclaim, there is no one in your family with that name. There's no one in your lineage that carries that authority. Why are you saying this now must happen? So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted the name to be. So it's interesting because most of us have thought, I'm sure most of you have thought, Zechariah was just unable to speak. But it sounds like he was deaf too because they had to motion to him what were you saying? Now, as a side note, when Jesus healed people who were mute and deaf, this sign was a sign of his authority because the Pharisees believed that if you could not name the Spirit, it could not be thrown out. They understood that to be a standard that they had to know. So when Jesus did this, they marvel at his authority in terms of his spiritual authority because it's so incredible to them because they didn't have that spiritual authority. Even though they did all the right things and lived the right lives and did all these things, they didn't have that. So the significance of him not just being able to, not only being deaf, but also mute, uh, not only being mute, sorry, but also deaf, is quite significant. So he motions for a writing tablet, verse 63. He motions for a writing tablet. And to everyone's surprise, he wrote, His name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. It's amazing how it's like he was, he was almost disobedient to the Lord, saying, No, man, if this can't be, um, it's never going to happen. And then the moment he steps into obedience, like the Lord just opens his mouth, and that's it. It's free. It's loose. It starts to talk about the power of forgiveness. It talks about the power of redemption because Christ's entire purpose for coming to earth was to reunite us with him. The thing that was lost in the Garden of Eden. It's quite a telling picture that too, yeah? The thing that was lost in the Garden of Eden, the separation between man and God, was as a result of unforgiveness. There was, a, there was a lack of connection. A holy and pure God couldn't be holy and pure and then be in the presence of something unholy 
or something unholy couldn't be in the presence of him. So rather than us be driven away from him, he created a space for us to be connected to him. And he kept his promise, which most of scripture is full of, it speaks about this voice in the desert, this, this, that's, that's announcing the coming king. There's this tradition of a crier, a town crier. The, the, the Zulu and the Tosa people, I know that well, have a, have a crier. They walk ahead and they announce, hey, listen, there's someone coming. You guys must get ready to, to show reverence. There's someone very important on their way. Hey, am I making sense, guys? Oh. I, I think of a story I was told, and I'm sidetracking slightly, but do you guys know the town of Mamzuntoti? It's actually pronounced Yamans Yimtoti. This place has sweet water. And the story goes that Shaka was walking along the beach with some of, the, of his soldiers, and one of them went ahead to test if the water was suitable for the king. And Shaka's mother's name was Nandi. So Nandi is the, is the Zulu word for sweetness. But if he said Amanziam Nandi, he may have offended Shaka's mother, which would have resulted in instant death. So he said Yamanziam Toti. And from then on, the place is known, as most of us know, as Toti. But, yeah. So there's this, this cry, this concept of this man going ahead shouting, hey, there's something coming. There's something significant. There's something special. There's something amazing. Get yourselves ready. And the evidence of his anointing is throughout his life, filled with the Holy Spirit before he's actually physically born. His, his mom that, that is almost a, a, pre, as a, a, a copy, as it were, or a, an echo of Sarah's experience. His father, Zechariah, in a sense the father like Abraham was, of this new, <coughs> sorry, this new dispensation that's on its way. And then I want to just share with you Zechariah's prophecy, where he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then his father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, gave this prophecy. So interesting how he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Specific, noted, particular. He says, praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has visited the re and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior. The Greek also speaks about, he has, he's raised up a horn of salvation to us. From the royal line of, of King David, so it speaks to the, the, the authority that Christ carries. Just as he promised through the holy prophets long ago, now we will be saved from our enemies for all who hate us and from all who hate us sorry he has been merciful to our ancestors and remembering his sacred covenant the covenant that he swore with an oath to our ancestor abraham he have rest he has res we have rescued sorry we have been rescued from our enemies so that we can serve god without fear in other words the real, the different, the kind of fear that we, our English understand, the fear of, of, of being scared of something. Verse 75, in holiness and righteousness, as long as we live, right standing with God, reconnected, as it were, taken back to the Eden experience where we have that connection with the Lord. <clears throat> and then Zechariah continues and he says, and you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. Because you will prepare the way of the Lord, you will tell his people and find how to find salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light of heaven is about to break upon us <coughs> to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to a path of peace. And John grew up and became strong in the spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry in Israel. John serves as a... <coughs> John... I've got a bullfrog again. John, John serves as a precursor, as a, as a crier. <clears throat> John
John serves as a precursor or a, or, a, or a crier. He announces this coming king. He says, it's on its way. It's happening soon. Get yourselves ready. What's so significant about this is, is that all the royal requirements, as it were, are fulfilled. All the spiritual requirements, according to Judaic law, are fulfilled. Everything is in place. And Christ's birth is so imminent. The air is quite literally pregnant with expectation. And this is why we call the New Testament the New Testament, because it's the new covenant. It's the new agreement. It's the, it's the bringing into the family of the Lord that, that the Father has prepared for us. And the concept of forgiveness now becomes a new concept, which sounds strange to us. But in the Old Testament, the only thing that sacrifice did was cover sin. It didn't take it away. They could go once a year and they could go and apologize. And I always said, but that's great, but now what happened if you sinned in January and then in February the Lord sounded the final trumpet? You know? So what about those guys who didn't get to go to the temple to go and make a sin offering, to go and, as it were, apologize to the Lord for what they'd done? And what struck me as so, so beautiful and so pertinent is that the Lord doesn't set us up to fail. He sets us up to succeed. He sets us up to grow. He sets us up to, to be good and healthy and wholesome people. But we have in a world full of sin and that we have the fallen reality of life around us. We, we, have, we have challenges that we face constantly and, and difficulties that we experience constantly. But there's a hope. There's a prospect. The town crier is saying, the king is coming, relax. It's okay. It, it strikes me as so fascinating as well that this whole concept of church is built on forgiveness. I was chatting with a colleague of mine recently and what came home for me so specifically was because of Christ's forgiveness of us, for us, because of his patience with us, if we graft into that vine, if we connect into him, that we start to become like that. We start to allow that DNA to flow through us. John never pranced around going, I'm the king's crier, you guys have got to respect me. He took, he took a low road and he just served. He was, he was active and, and serving. We know that later when Jesus is baptized, that all the Pharisees went to go and watch what he was up to. They all were standing around looking at what he was doing. But they weren't... They weren't stopping him from doing what he was doing. So there would have been some sense of an awareness that, hey, listen, there's something here. There's something happening. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this. The, the profound reality of forgiveness, the profound reality of salvation, I don't think that we all really always completely understand it. 2,000 plus years ago, a man was born to announce a coming king. After 400 years of silence, a savior, a messiah on his way. That 400 years of silence imitating the 400 years in the desert that was had by the Israelites. So God kind of proving and reproving. At the end of the Israelites' age, in the, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, we see the Passover lamb ritually slaughtered for the tech protection of death. That then echoed in the life of John, kind of announcing, hey, there's a Passover lamb coming. And 33 years later, how he died on a cross for us to offer forgiveness and for us to be able to receive and to give this forgiveness. We, in Western culture, I think we, we confuse meekness with weakness. We, we see it as weak and, and tender. But the Lord came in the form of a helpless little baby, seemingly innocuous, seemingly non, nonchalant and uneventful, but for an incredible purpose. I want to kind of reach out to all of you and say, let's put the Christ back in Christmas. It's, it's kind of why we share a gift with people. We share a gift not to garner favor, not because they've been wishing for it all year, I share a gift with them as a symbol of the magnitude of the gift that was given to us. 
that everything was prepared so long ago just so that we could say, Lord, I've blown it. Please forgive me. That we could be connected together with one another, that we could support one another, that we could encourage one another, that we could meet together like this to celebrate that love. And how many people, how many of us have unsaved family members? Yet they all sing the carols, eh? Whatever it takes. Share the truth. Be, share it lovingly. And hopefully one day we'll get to be in Eden again. Can I commit us to prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to just come before you, Lord, and ask you, Lord, for your love to shine through. Lord, as we see how you prepared a way for us. Help us to take hold of that, Lord. Give us the wisdom to see your heart, your truth, and your purpose. Lord, as we depart one from another and we'll lay together together again, Lord, I want to pray for tonight. I want to ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would bring those who you have chosen to, to come and meet with you here tonight, Lord. We want to make a place for them, Father God. We want to make a space for some, someone or, some, or, or many ones. We don't know, Lord. But we want to make a space where they can come to know you, Father. A space where they can be drawn into family. A place where they can be discipled and taught, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that if there was people that you want to have here tonight and they decide they have other plans, frustrate those plans, Lord. Bring them tonight, Father God. And bring us all back together again, Lord, if it's your will, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.